The Tom Woods Show, episode 786. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're looking to have a website design that's attractive, effective, and leaves people with a great impression, then check out vondesign.com, V-A-W-N design.com slash woods. They're giving my listeners a special deal where they're going to give you a free mock-up of what your website's going to look like, how great it's going to be, so you don't have to roll the dice, and they give you excellent prices. Check them out at Vaughn Design, V-A-W-N Design dot com slash woods. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. The Electoral College is our subject for today. That's a topic that's been on a lot of people's minds ever since the election of Donald Trump, given that Hillary Clinton won the so-called popular vote. So why is she not the American president? So we're going to talk about the Electoral College, its origins, and its merits or otherwise. And we're going to do so with two great American historians, the first of whom is Brian McClanahan, who holds a PhD from the University of South Carolina. He's the author of many books, including The Founding Fathers' Guide to the Constitution and The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Founding Fathers, among other books. You can check him out at brianmcclanahan.com. That's Brian with an O, B-R-I-O-N, brianmcclanahan.com. You should also listen to The Brian McClanahan Show, his podcast. And what else do I want to say about Brian? Brian is also, as is Kevin, uh, professor at mylibertyclassroom.com, so he teaches U.S. history there, so you can unlearn the U.S. history you got in school and learn the real thing from Brian and Kevin and from me, because I also teach at Liberty Classroom in the U.S. history to 1877 and since 1877 courses. But you can get a free course, by the way. This is too many websites I'm giving you. Get a free course on the presidents, the true history of the presidents, taught by Brian at Free History Course. Dot com. So if you're having trouble keeping track of all those links, and they're all juicy, you're going to want to visit every single one of them, they will all be at, here comes another link, tomwoods.com slash 786. Kevin Gutzman is a professor and chairman of the Department of History at Western Connecticut State University. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution, and among other books, James Madison and the Making of America, published by St. Martin's. His next book is Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary, slated for release in 2017. Follow Kevin over at Kevin Gutzman, G-U-T-Z-M-A-N dot com. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Happy Thanks to be for here. having me, Tom. All right, now look, I was just saying I could have done this episode with one of you guys, with both, with just myself, but it's a lot more fun for the three of us to sit down and talk about pretty much anything. So the Electoral College, why not? That's a good enough reason to gather all of us together. Let's talk about the Electoral College. First of all, I guess, and particularly given that about 17% of listeners to the show are from countries other than the United States, they may not actually know how the Electoral College works. And you know what? In parentheses, maybe some Americans don't quite know how it works. So, Brian, just take 60 seconds, describe how the Electoral College works, then we're going to get into why we have it. Okay, well, the Electoral College um, is essentially the system that elects the President of the United States. When you go and vote for president, theoretically, you're not actually voting for the president. You're voting for a slate of electors or unelector, depends on where you are, that would then cast a vote for the president of the United States. And that was originally designed as a way, well, uh, well I, I don't want to get ahead, but the states are involved in the process. And so when you, when you look at the returns and you start looking at, well, you know, the popular vote is this amount or the popular vote is that amount, that actually wasn't even tallied until 1824. So the first several elections in American history, presidential elections, you didn't have the popular vote even matter. It's not even, you can't even find it. Uh, and so you had the electors going out and voting for the president of the United States. And so this, this system, of course, is seen as anti-democratic. Uh, it's seen as a, as, a, as a process by which the people are not represented because you can have a situation where somebody will lose the popular vote but still win the electoral college. And so I guess the, the point is, you know, people are looking at this and saying, why do we still have this antiquated, archaic system that uh, doesn't seem to fit with modern democracy? Uh, and that's, you know, the main thrust of the argument uh, against it. And um, I tend to support, and I'm sure you know, Kevin does too, but um, it, it's, it's a system by which you have an indirect election for the president of the United States. All right. Now, as we all know, there's a lot of consternation right now because of the defeat of Hillary Clinton. Well, more the victory of Donald Trump. And 
therefore, you got people who support Hillary saying she got more votes, so she's the winner. I contend that somebody who speaks that way does not understand the United States at all. Uh, Kevin, can you back me up on that that bold contention? Well, it's <laughs> yes, I agree with you in terms of the actual structure of our constitutional system. And, of course, that claim is nonsensical in re- relation to the way that elections work. So we have this electoral college system that Brian just uh, described. And candidates thinking about how to campaign, how to amass electoral college majorities, don't even consider the question whether they're going to get the majority of popular votes. So if it's true that, um, as happened recently, um, one candidate wins 49 states by 2 million votes and then loses the other state by 3 million after essentially not campaigning there, uh, you can end up in a situation in which the person who wins the Electoral College doesn't have more popular votes than the other one, but it's because in our system that doesn't matter. It doesn't have anything to do with being elected. If it did have anything to do with being elected, then the candidates would campaign to try to maximize their popular votes. So um, you would see Republicans campaigning in California. You would see Democrats campaigning in Alabama. And the outcome would be unrelated to the Electoral College outcome. So besides that, uh, I said it's not really a reflection of any understanding of our constitutional system. Our constitutional system is a federal one, not a national one. And so um, the way that it was structured was to ensure the ongoing role of the states in the system, just as the House of Representatives um, isn't uh, composed of people who were elected from uh, districts with equal populations. Why is that? Well, it's because the representatives are divvied up among states, and that means you're going to have some variance in population between the least populous House of Representatives district and the most populous House of Representatives district. It's a federal uh, legislature. It's a federal legislative body. And of course, the Senate has um, it doesn't reflect population at all. So you could say, well, uh, X party won a majority of popular votes for the U.S. Senate. Nobody ever says that, by the way. Have you ever noticed that? There's a reason for that. Um, But it would be the same kind of observation. So uh, it's nonsense. It's brought up every few years. It's basically because uh, California has become a kind of rotten borough where, uh, as I said, Republicans essentially don't campaign, and so Democrats run up huge majorities while they're getting swamped in the rest of the country. When I used to teach, I gave this analogy, and I pointed out that it's obviously imperfect, but it helps people to think the right way. I said, imagine the World Series. Team A wins the first three games, eight to one, each game, eight to one, eight to one, eight to one. Team B wins the second three games, two to one, two to one, two to one, two to one, and then Team B wins the seventh game, two to one. Well, Team B wins the World Series, and people would think it was just being a sore loser for Team A to say, but we scored a greater absolute number of runs over the course of the games than the other one did. That has nothing to do with it whatsoever. No, no one has ever measured a World Series that way, and it would be viewed as bizarre for anyone to raise that objection. It would be, that, that would be the ultimate sore loser objection. It's how many games did you win? Well, since the United States is a collection of societies, in effect – now, granted, there's some waiting for population, Idaho – is not the same thing as California, but all the same, it's it's analogous to saying how many societies did you win? How many little societies did you win? How many games did you win? The United States is supposed to be different from other countries. Remember that whole thing? We're so unique and wonderful. Well, one thing that makes us a unique is that we're a collection of societies, and we're not just an undifferentiated aggregate of, of individuals. What about this claim? Oh, by the way, is that a legitimate – I mean, uh, granted that it's not a perfect analogy. You guys go for that? Kevin here. Uh, yeah, actually, I think if you think about the strategy involved in in managing the World Series, um, your analogy is illuminating. So, for example, in Game 1, 
the club that's down six to one in the eighth inning isn't going to put in its best relief pitcher because it doesn't care what the final margin is at that point. They know they've lost. They want to save their best pitchers for the remaining games, and so they don't throw their number one guy out there in the ninth inning. On the other hand, if it mattered what the margin was in game one, the if that had anything to do with who was ultimately going to win the series then you might see the the ace closer come on in the ninth inning with the the score seven to one to try to ensure that there weren't any more runs scored. So that is wow. Well, my analogy is far better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's like Trump not spending much effort campaigning in California. There, there's right. just no reason for him to go waste money and his own time or or Pence's time or or some Trump offspring's time or anyone's time in trying to get more votes in California when they know they've lost. And so again, you get to the ninth inning of game one, you're down six to one, you're you're gonna put the scrub uh, you know, uh middle reliever out there to get batted around a little bit because you really don't care. You just wanna get the game over with and let's move on to game two. Right. Well, I also think, too, um, about this, when you look at not just the World Series, but you look at these professional leagues. I mean, they are leagues, and so you can compare the United States to that as well. You have, you have these independent clubs that manage things differently from other clubs. You know, how the New York Yankees run their franchise might be different from the Boston Red Sox. But at the end of the day, they're all in this league, and supposedly, theoretically, the league is supposed to benefit and burden all equally in this league. So... Uh, looking at a professional sports league with all the teams, and it, it, it's developed in the same way uh, that that it should be uniform in how the uh, you know, how these how these leagues how these teams in these leagues operate in terms of you know who's going to benefit from the rules of the league or who's going to be unduly burdened by the rules of the league. You see this more in the NFL than than Major League Baseball, but um, I think that's also a nice anal- analogy for the for the United States as well. So uh, I think your sports analogy works, Tom. All right, well, that's good. I haven't followed baseball since uh, the Red Sox lost the World Series in 86. So, but, but the old noodle still works, you know, up here. It's still, you know, wheels are still turning up there. I want to point out, first of all, that I like, I'm glad, Kevin, that you mentioned that if the object had been to win the greater number of popular votes, then the campaign strategy would have been different for both. So there's no telling what would have happened. That, to me, is decisive. What can we say about this claim that it's almost like anything the left doesn't like. If you go back far enough in history, it had something to do with slavery. So the Second Amendment had to do with slavery, and now it's the Electoral College had to do with slavery. I'd like each of you to comment on that. Tell me, I want the entirety of the evidence for that claim, please. Kip, would you like your first go? (laughs) Well, sure. It it happens that uh, the three of us are speaking on a Thursday, and on Monday this week, I was in Minneapolis participating in the annual symposium of the um, St. Thomas University Law School. And one of the other three uh, scholars presenting papers on in the symposium was a legal historian named Paul Finkelman, who's the guy who's currently pushing this argument that the Electoral College is all about slavery. Uh, it's his recent article that has gotten all this attention. Um, and this is a ridiculous argument. I mean, the bottom line is it's ridiculous. One of the very first questions that was taken up in the Philadelphia Convention was uh, what the shape of the executive branch ought to be. So the the Virginia plan, which was presented by the Virginia delegation at the very beginning of the convention, included a call for there to be, in the words of the Virginia plan, quote-unquote, a national executive. It didn't say what shape the national executive ought to have. It didn't say whether there should be one uh, presiding officer in the executive branch or whether there ought to be a committee or whether there ought to be a presiding officer with the committee or whether he ought to have somebody cooperating with him in vetoing bills or somebody cooperating with him in pardoning people. Or It didn't say anything like that. And one of the first issues that came up in relation uh, to the executive was, well, even if we get past the question how to structure it, how are we going to select this person or these people? And when a nationalist delegate from Pennsylvania, James Wilson, the immigrant from Scotland, said, of course, we should have a a national election, we should have citizens vote, the immediate reaction of other delegates was to say, uh, as Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts put it, we have suffered from an excess of democracy. 
And a lot of people thought that the reason why American government was in such a bad pass in 1787 was that the newly republicanized state constitutions were too democratic. They gave too much authority to the lower houses of the legislatures, and they had uh, democratized them by getting rid of property qualifications, by making districts very tiny, and so on. And so uh, there was a lot of pushback against that idea of having a national election. And in fact, that proved to be a very unpopular idea, having a national election. Instead, uh, you end up with this mechanism we have, which is that there should be voting within each state for informed people who then would decide who should be the president. And the idea here was that, as one delegate put it later on in the summer uh, in Philadelphia, your typical voter in, say, Georgia didn't know anything about the typical politician in New Hampshire or the typical politician in, or the typical voter in Massachusetts didn't know anything about the typical politician in South Carolina and therefore having a national election really wouldn't make any sense it would be uh, uninformed people casting completely uninformed votes and so the idea was that if you took the political elite in each state and elected some of them to make the choice of the president they would be attuned to the political records and personalities of people who had been in Congress or had been governors or had been on state Supreme Courts or whatever. And then these informed people, ultimately the presidential electors, the Electoral College, they could cast a, a more informed and more appropriate vote. And I think the utility or the desirability of a system more like that than the one we've come to have, where we have essentially popular elections for president in each state um, now, I think the desirability of having something more like what the people in the Philadelphia Convention envisioned is, uh, is shown by the kind of people who have become president in my lifetime. I'm, I'm 53, and we've had in my lifetime um, Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, and it seems to me that all of those are people who couldn't have been elected before. There are also uh, Gary Hart wouldn't have been chosen by the political elite and so on, informed people from each state. Why? Well, because each of these guys had character flaws that were just glaringly obvious to anybody else who'd been uh, in the highest levels of politics, but which were unknown to the common public. And Well, except in the case of Hart, whose monkey business escapades became known, but he, he was a leading candidate for much of the 84 election cycle, and it was because chiefly because people didn't know anything about him. They, he was he was just a kind of uh, campaign um, image, and so the the fact of the manipulation we um, witness in our contemporary presidential election campaigns is, uh, I think, a validation of the idea of the electoral college. So, for example, think of the recently released audio of Mrs. Clinton. Um, while she was a candidate for president, telling high-dollar donors, I think it was a Goldman Sachs private meeting, well, of course, I have to have one position in private and another one in public. That is exactly what the idea of, elect of the Electoral College was intended to help avoid. Right. And I think the idea, too, that this is all tied into slavery um, if you look at the, peop the people that were against national popular vote, I mean, a lot of these people came from northern states. Uh, and last I checked, most of these northern states had abolished slavery by the time you got to 1787. So uh, the, the fact that you have a cherry-picking essentially is what happens. They've cherry-picked Madison, uh, and where he, supposedly he supported uh, you know, slavery as a, as a reason for the Electoral College. Uh, what they've done is erase the entire Philadelphia Convention debates, uh, because you have over and over again individuals from these northern states saying, no, we're, we're afraid of democracy. We're afraid of the effect that that will have on the, on the executive branch. And, of course, as Mason said, you know, we don't want an elected monarch. Uh, we don't want a popular elected monarch. That's very dangerous for the future of the United States. And essentially, that's what you're going to get if you abolish the Electoral College. And, of course, there is a proposal to do that. It's called the National Popular Vote Initiative. And it's, it's, it would be a disaster uh, because uh, you would have a situation where the Electoral College is essentially eliminated uh, and you would have er, essentially you know, a few pockets in the United States controlling the election 
uh, for president. So um, the the fact that you know slavery is even mentioned this is just as Kevin says completely ridiculous. It's a preposterous idea that somehow that was behind the entire proposal for the electoral college. Now this let's talk about that national initiative because I think it's a way. I'm not sure I remember the details, but it's a way to get around the necessity that would exist otherwise of amending the Constitution right. to get rid of the Electoral College. Because you realize that obviously three-quarters of the states would never vote to, to get rid of the Electoral College because they would just be signing their own death warrants. They benefit from the Electoral College. Right. The, 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 the president could get elected campaigning in New York, uh, Florida, and California and ignore the rest of the country if there were no Electoral College. So they'd never amend the Constitution. That would never happen. But they could do an end run around it. And how, how, what would that look like? So what what it happens is that of course you need 270 electoral college votes to win the presidency, and that's the, that's the majority of the electoral college votes. So if you could get enough states with that many electoral college votes to sign off on this national popular vote initiative, it doesn't matter who wins that state; it matters who wins the overall popular vote. So obviously states like New York and California and some of these they would sign on to it, because what would happen is it would it would invalidate what happens in Alabama because. Uh, you know, Hillary Clinton right now is maybe ahead by about 700,000 popular votes, I think, last time I checked. So it really doesn't matter, you know, if, if, uh, if Alabama had signed on to this, for example, if Donald Trump won Alabama, if Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, all the electoral college votes would go then to Hillary Clinton. And, of course, the states can decide how their electoral college votes are collected and how they're, how they're divvied up. Um, so this is, in that regard, this would be constitutional. But the question would be, is this now uh, an interstate compact uh, that would somehow be unconstitutional because the, the, the Constitution denies states the ability to do that? Um, so, but yes, you don't, have to, you don't have to amend the Constitution. You just say, okay, in our state, it doesn't matter who, who, we, who wins our state. It matters who wins the popular vote, and we're going to assign our electoral college votes to that person. So you're right. It's an end around the Constitution, and it would completely destroy... Uh, having the states have any role in the, ele- in, in the election of the president. One other thing that has to be said about this, too, is that if there's no majority in the Electoral College, the election is then thrown to the House of Representatives, which has happened, and vote there is by state, not by individual delegates. So it, com- it shows completely that the states were intended to be part of this process in selecting the president, not just you know, this amorphous mass of people out there saying, I'm going to vote for, you know, candidate X or Y or whatever it is, uh, because they're going to give me free stuff. I mean, this is, this, is, this is why the states were part of this, to prevent this type of situation. Can one of you describe, explain the phenomenon of the faithless elector? Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> well, the faithless elector, this is, a na- this is a current new phenomenon, right? Because you've got, you're supposed to, whoever wins your state, you take a pledge, all right? So I'm an elector in the state of Alabama where I live. I, I take a pledge. Now, there are two slates of electors. There are Republican electors and Democratic electors. So if Hillary Clinton somehow magically won the state of Alabama in 2016, those Democratic electors would have voted for Hillary Clinton. The same thing with the Republican electors. So what they've done, of course, the electors can theoretically make their own choice. They can go in and say, you know what, I know that the state went Trump, but I'm going to vote for Ron Paul because, you know, I, I don't want this Trump guy. I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm just going to vote for Ron Paul and be principled and support that. Well, there's a fine for that now. Almost every state has a fine, and this actually came up in this election because there was a guy, I think it was in Washington or Oregon, I can't remember, where he said, look, if Clinton wins, I don't care. She's so corrupt, I can't vote for her, so I'm going to vote, cast my electoral college vote for somebody else. And they would have fined him $1,000 if he did that. So the states have tried to establish a situation where these electors will go with whoever they're told to vote for under penalty of a fine, typically if they don't do it. But I guess if someone has $1,000 and didn't care blowing it, well, I mean, you can vote for whoever you want. You still have a situation where the electors can vote for who they want. And I think that is something that people should know more about because these electors, as Kevin just described it in the system, should be free to vote for who they think should be the best person, no matter who wins the popular vote in that state. And I think you know the system that Nebraska and Maine has is actually preferable to any of the others because you actually do electoral, you divvy up the electoral college votes by district, and then you have at-large delegates. So it would actually allow a third-party candidate maybe to make inroads and, and create some chaos in the system and have it potentially be thrown to the House or have a situation where you know, a third party might actually make, make some headway and get close to winning the presidency. So um, it, it's, uh, we, it, the system has been corrupted by the national parties, I think, is, is the end of the story. The, the Republican and Democratic parties have corrupted the entire process and created this monster that we have now. Tom, let me make a comment about that. Um, 
It's a very interesting constitutional question whether a state actually can find an elector for his vote. I I would tend to think that it couldn't. Um, that has never been litigated, of course. The other thing is this system we're used to in which virtually every state uh, decrees that all of its electors will go to the candidate who won, wins a plurality of popular votes. Um, this idea actually was central to Thomas Jefferson's victory in the 1800 presidential election. What happened was that in 1796, there were a couple of districts in Virginia that gave their uh, electoral votes to John Adams. And so when the uh, 1800 election was in the offing, James Madison, who had retired from Congress, uh, had sought election to the state legislature to protest the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. And then he also steered through the Virginia General Assembly a reform of its uh, allocation of electors so that from that point, that all of them would go to whomever won the majority of popular votes. Of course, what this meant was that um, Fredericksburg and Richmond would no longer be able to cast votes for Federalists. That those two towns were were little islands of Federalism in, a, in the Great Virginia Republican Sea. And at the same time as this was going on, um, Aaron Burr succeeded in changing the uh, city of New York's support from the Federalist column to the Republican column. When that happened. Alexander Hamilton uh, wrote a letter to his friend, the governor of New York, John Jay, and said, well, in light of these uh, election outcomes this year, our assembly is now going to be controlled by Republicans. We sh you should call a special session before the Republicans take control and have the outgoing Federalists cast our electoral votes for Adams. And Jay uh, left this letter in his papers. On the back of it, there was in Jay's handwriting the observation that um, this letter recommends a uh, measure for party purposes, which I do not believe it would become me to adopt. So if it hadn't been for the fact that John Jay had, shall we say, a higher ethical standard than James Madison, um, John Adams would have been reelected in 1800. If either Adams or Jay, Jay had, I'm sorry, if either Madison or Jay had acted differently, uh, Adams would have been reelected in 1800. What else? What are we leaving out here about the Electoral College? Am I missing anything? I don't think so. I mean, the the oh, good. I, mean, <laughs> I, I think I think we've covered all the bases. The Electoral College is is, in, in my opinion, essential to ensure that you have a real federal election, uh, and that the we don't have this uh, this awful system where you would have, you know, as, as as Kevin described it, California voting for your president every single election cycle. I mean, this is this is what's this is what's at stake. Uh, and so, if we if we succumb to this idea that we need we're a democracy, which is completely false, then we're going to run into a situation where every state and the people of these states, which of course Trump won more states than than I mean, Clinton won very few states, and and of course. Uh, you know, if we if we want a system where the majority of the people are are represented in the states themselves, then we have to keep the electoral college, and that's that's real federalism. Well, another thing to notice about the California phenomenon is that the governor of California, Jerry Brown, has repeatedly invited illegal aliens to come into the state, and he's basically said that they're free to vote. So even if we end up with a, a popular vote margin. Uh, of a couple hundred thousand votes in favor of Mrs. Clinton, which, as I explained at the beginning of our conversation, is really just an artifact. It, it doesn't tell us anything at all about the popularity of the two candidates. But if we ended up with that, we still don't know uh, how American citizens voted, because in California, there's this chicanery going on. And I think in future election cycles, California's behavior will get worse in this regard. So mm -hmm. there's even more reason to oppose eliminating the Electoral College. Yeah. And of course, I've seen estimates as many as three million votes have been cast by illegals. So, Me too. Uh, yeah. And actually, we yeah, know that in past, in past off-year election cycles, according to the Washington Post, there were hundreds of thousands of illegal aliens voting. Yeah. And uh, this means, among other things, that Al Franken almost certainly was elected by illegal alien voting in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And he it, cast it's a dangerous vote in favor of Obamacare. <laughs> right. It's a dangerous proposition. Uh, to, to have the popular vote be, be the model 
that we would follow. And of course, you know, there was just an article in the Washington Post the other day about abolishing the state. So this is this is this is where we are. Uh, I think in 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 the American uh, polity, we're, we're talking about these issues because the the, the left is whining about uh, a situation where they they can't necessarily win by cheating um, and. If they can get rid of the states, this has been the dream of all nationalists. You know, there was talk of abolishing the states in Philadelphia. So the states are the problem. And for the nationalists, they always have been. Uh, And right now, the nationalists on the right are okay. The neocons are okay because they think they're going to get back in power and they can force their will on everyone else. But um, as soon as those nationalists are out, they'll talk about other things, too. So um, it's the real the real kicker in all this is that we need to emphasize federalism is is the design of of the US constitution it's the federal re, uh, republic uh and that it's not a singular popular vote republic and uh you know move forward we're not France in other words we're not a unitary state uh and that I think that's the that's the important thing to get out of this all right and with that I'm going to say thank you to Brian and Kevin this is the maybe I'll title this episode did you did you, did you guys ever read the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy no. Part, yeah. Well, I mean, I, oh. I, it's hard for me to remember. But yes, I've, I've, I've read it years ago. Oh, my gosh. I'm, my esti- I mean, f- first, Kevin has terrible musical taste, so he's already <laughs> way, way out there. And now this, I was going to say, I'm going to call this the Electoral College, colon, the ultimate answer to the ultimate question. <laughs> but but you don't even know the reference. Because, uh, uh, but I'll tell you, for people listening, the idea is that in in one of the books – they're building this machine that's going to come up with the ultimate answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. So they build it, and they wait and with anticipation. The machine spits out the answer, and the answer is 42. <laughs> so it makes them think, I guess we don't know what the question is. They have to build another machine to go figure out the question. So I was thinking that people have been waiting for the ultimate the analogy breaks down, you understand, because we actually are giving the ultimate answer. But people have been saying, you've got to give us an episode on the Electoral College. I'm getting killed on this question. I think this does it. I don't think we ever have to talk about the Electoral College again. I'm going to refer people forever just to tomwoods.com slash 786. So there's nothing else to know. And also, Brian, you did an episode on the Electoral College. I did, yeah. So, so I also want to make sure people visit brianmcclanahan.com. Brian is spelled B-R-I-O-N, so visit that. kevingutzman.com. All kinds of stuff about these two gentlemen will also be at tomwoods.com slash 786. All right, here's hoping we're talking about uh, impeachment one of these days. And uh, thanks again. Thanks, well, Tom. Tom, uh, you're welcome. And now I'm going to go to a meeting of Rush and Yes fans where we're going to talk about the significance of the number 42. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you're getting the idea, Kevin. Now you're get- Maybe I'll get- let you back on the show now. All right, see you guys. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thank you. All right, that's our episode for today. LibertyClassroom.com is where both of these gentlemen teach U.S. history. You can learn real U.S. history on the go. We're having our annual huge Black Friday sale at Liberty Classroom. So if you've been on the fence, hop off the fence on Black Friday, which this year, I guess, is November. You'd think I would have checked this before starting to talk, wouldn't you? November 25th. November 25th. So make sure and head over to libertyclassroom.com on November 25th and get your super duper 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 deal on it. And if you are an affiliate, if you're a good salesman, and you want to clean up commission-wise, then join my affiliate contest for that weekend at woodscontest.com. I believe that may be the largest number of websites I have given out in one episode ever. So get them all straight at the one place you do need to remember, the one page on the Internet you've got to remember for all this stuff. It's simply tomwoods.com slash 786. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.